In this video, we're going to take a look at combinations, and in combinations, different than permutations where order matters, in combinations we're looking really at groups or collections of objects. So in our last video, we took a look at this exact question, where we said a pool of 10 candidates, there three are chosen to be president, vice president, and secretary. How many such linear arrangements are possible? So we knew this was a permutation, because it matters which candidate is president, vice president, and secretary. So we knew that we had a permutation of 10 objects and we were choosing three of them. Now, using the function that we learned in our last video, that means we have 10 factorial over 10 minus three factorial, or 10 factorial over seven factorial, and that was 720. Now, if we take a look at the different positions of say, Abby, Ben, and Carter, we have Abby president, and then Ben vice president, Carter secretary, or Abby president, and then Carter vice president, and B, who's B? Ben is secretary. So we get the idea that all six of these are combinations where Abby, Ben, and Carter are one of the three candidates chosen. So when order matters, those are all separate choices, but if we're just choosing, say, members of a committee, then all of these would be the exact same committee. It doesn't matter the order in which I choose the members of, of the committee, it's all the same committee group. That means that we have to divide our previous total of 720 by six, or three factorial because every six collections is actually the same collection. So if you'll take a look, we have the permutation of 10 comma three, and we're dividing it by three factorial or six, and we end up with 120. So obviously, instead of having to do that every single time, we need a way to express this mathematically. And that is a combination rather than a permutation. So notice we're still going to use n for the number of distinct objects. And we didn't really stress the fact that these are distinct, but distinct meaning they're not identical. So that will be a whole different situation if we have identical objects. So if we have these distinct objects, and we, are, we have a collection of k of them where the order doesn't make a difference, essentially what we're saying is we have, we're going to find the number of permutations and then we're going to divide it by k factorial because k factorial is the number of permutations of size k. So if we think back to the example we just looked at, there were three objects that we chose, three factorial is what we divided by, which was six. And we divided by that because every collection of six objects was exactly the same. And so that's why, that's where this formula comes from. So a lot of people just focus on, hey, here's the equation you're going to use, or here's the function that you're going to use. And that's fine to do that, but just make sure that you understand where it comes from. We're finding the number of permutations and then we're dividing by the number of permutations of that set of that size. Um, so using our example, again, we have 10 comma three. So we have 10 factorial over three factorial and then 10 minus three factorial. So really this was the permutation. Um, and then we're dividing by that three factorial as well, which was 120. Before we talk in any more detail about any of these items, I do want to just quickly show you how to use a TI 83, 84, 85 to do these calculations for you. So again, we are just going to choose the math option and we're going to take a look at both permutations and combinations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to arrow over to probability. So I can either arrow over to the right three times or to the left twice until probability is highlighted. Then I can choose option two if I'm trying to find NPR. And so again, instead of 10 comma three, it's 10P three. 
and it's going to find that solution for you. I can do the exact same thing, math, prob, and then three for 10 choose three, and it's going to find the combination for me. And of course, lastly, I can also go to math, prob, and I can actually just enter each value myself um, using the factorial, should I choose to do that. Just as we talked about with permutations, is p5 comma 3 could also be written as 5p3, which is what we just saw using our TI-84. We can also write combinations in the same way. So as you can see, I could write this as nck, but quite often you will see it written just like this. Now notice this is not a fraction it is called a binomial coefficient, and the way that we say that is n choose k. So what we just talked about would be 5 choose 3. Now, whenever it's written like this, it is implied that it is, in fact, a combination and not a permutation. So for a permutation, it's only these two ways. But for a combination, most often you're going to see it written like this. So we're going to learn a lot more about binomial coefficients in our next section, section 6.4. But um, before we look at an example using combinations and binomial coefficients, I want to talk about two things that will come into play quite often. So for the first, n choose 0 is the same as n choose n. So if we think about what our function was for combination of n choose k. Remember that told us to take n factorial over k factorial and minus k factorial. So this makes perfect sense. n choose 0 would be n factorial over 0 factorial over n minus 0, which is n factorial. And n choose n would be n factorial n factorial over n minus n factorial. So we can see that these two things are the same because this would obviously be 0 factorial and we would end up with the exact same result. Same thing would happen for our second um, equation or our second equality. This would be n factorial over 1 factorial and minus 1 factorial, and this would be n factorial and minus 1 factorial, and then n minus n minus 1 factorial, which would be the exact same thing. Oops, n minus n minus 1, giving us that positive 1 factorial. So it makes perfect sense mathematically why those would be the same. In our next video, we're going to take a look at some combinatorial arguments that can help us to make sense of these um, in a common sense way as opposed to um, a mathematical way. Obviously, there are a lot of applications for permutations and combinations, and we could have an entire video just full of examples. Um, and we will have plenty of examples as we move through this course. But let's take a look at this particular example, which has to do with the Powerball um, and the number of possible combinations that are involved in the Powerball. So there are five balls chosen from a bin of 69 white balls and one red ball chosen from a bin of 26 red balls. Find the number of com combinations. So first off, this is a combination question and not a permutation question because the white balls are chosen from a bin. So it doesn't matter if I choose 23 first and 42 second or vice versa, it's still going to be the same outcome. So the number of combinations of white balls is we have 69 white balls and we are choosing five of them. The number of combinations of red balls is we have 26 red balls and we're just choosing one of them. So rule of product says if I want the total number of combinations, so total is just multiplying 69 choose 5 times 26 choose 1, which is 
201,338, which means if you're playing the Powerball, you have a 1 in 292,201,338 chance of winning the jackpot. Now, obviously, things get more complicated when you're talking about matching one number, matching two numbers, and so forth. Uh, but if that's of interest to you, you can certainly get on the Powerball website and take a look at the odds page. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at just some counting practice. So just that practice that I told you that we would do to make sure we really understand these concepts. And I also want to talk to you about combinatorial proof.